Yeah, you're probably thinking I'm not old enough to be a senior lecturer. That's what I feel like most of the time. Um, so yeah, we're moving back in time a bit. Um, if you don't know very much about the picks, I've got a little volume here you might want to buy off me. <laughs> uh, all proceeds go to charity, the uh, historical introduction to the Northern Picts by Nick Evans. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, so in my paper today, I want to look at the other end of the chronological spectrum for royal centres in Scotland, uh, examining a Pictish ceremonial centre in the post-Roman centuries. Um, and my work is focused at a site called Rhiney in Aberdeenshire, um, and I began to reveal an, important, uh, reveal an important Pictish central place of the 5th and 6th centuries AD. So going back in time uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> so I want to outline today uh, some of the evidence that we have so far, including the place name evidence, um, and explore the role that cult and ideology played in the establishment and maintenance of power in this important landscape. So the place name evidence for Rhiney is our first clue to the importance of this uh, landscape. So Juliana Grieg and Simon Taylor recently, recently identified the place name as containing the early uh, Celtic uh, re for king, uh, and the provisional reconstruction of Rhiney in early Celtic uh, being uh, re a uh, place of or associated with a great king, um, which is quite a nice clue. So here's, here's Rhiney, just uh, west of uh, Aberdeen. Um, and from the archaeology, hopefully we can begin to show that this royal place name is quite an appropriate description for what we're beginning to find here uh, in this early Pictish period. So Rhiney was well known for uh, its uh, symbol stones, um, these characteristic uh, uh, carved stone monuments dating from 5th century AD onwards. Um, and perhaps most famous for this character here, the Rhiney man, which I'll come back to later on with the big pointy teeth. Um, our excavations to date have uh, focused on uh, this uh, crop mark enclosure, um, identified first in the 1970s uh, by Ian Ralston. Um, and you can see that one of the symbol stones uh, stands in association with these crop mark enclosures. Uh, excavations in 2011 and 2012 uh, very quickly identified that these enclosures relate to uh, a fortified site dating to the 5th and 6th centuries AD. Um, and the cross stain, uh, the symbol stone here on the right, stands at the entranceway to the inner enclosures um, of this uh, place. It's defined on the outside by uh, a wooden enclosure, a box rampart or a palisade uh, made of split oak planks, um, and a setting of posts on, on, the, in, on the interior. Uh, you can just see the, uh, the uh, maybe you just see the plank slots uh, uh, on this uh, slide here. Uh, it has two ditched enclosures on the outside, um, and lots of really interesting structures, uh, perhaps an entrance structure here or a building right next to the cross, cross stain. Um, and inside we have evidence for rectangular buildings here with uh, squared timbers, um, and possibly larger structures as well, made from plank architecture. <clears throat> uh, the finds give us a, a clue as to what's going on here. Um, we have a number of shards now of uh, late Roman amphora, or beware, as it's uh, traditionally known. Uh, and you'll see from the distribution of beware that it comes from some of the key early medieval, normally royal sites known in Ireland and uh, Western Britain. Uh, Rhiney is the northernmost finds in the world, um, and the only ones in the whole of Eastern Britain. And these were probably for uh, storing wine. Um, we also have uh, nice bits of metalwork, bronze pins um, of Anglo-Saxon uh, type, uh, and uh, shards of glass from drinking beakers. And this is exactly what kings would have been drinking that fine Mediterranean wine out of in the 5th and 6th centuries AD. We also have evidence for the actual making of metalwork as well. This is Scotland's only known early medieval metalworking tongs, uh, you can see here. Um, and the dating is pretty conclusive so far in terms of, uh, this is the rate of carbon dates. You can see 450 to 550 seems to be the span for this site. And all those dates come from just about every element that I've shown there. So incredibly tight chronology uh, for, this, uh, for this site and this, and this landscape here. Um, and that dating is very interesting. Um, we should put together all the dating for Pictish forts. 
then they seem to originate in this 450 to 550 AD uh, period. Um, so a key transition moment, I think, in uh, the history of these northern Pictish societies. Uh, so this is a, a reconstruction drawing of what Rhiney might have looked like in uh, the 5th and 6th centuries AD. There was a cross stain standing inside the outer palisade or box rampart here with a wall walk. Um, and uh, here's the Rhiney man. Uh, when you plot where he was found in the 1970s, it appears to come from one of the entranceways into this fortified um, complex. So really quite exciting uh, results starting to, to come out, really. So I'm not going to dwell on what we've uh, found in terms of the archaeology. I want to try and uh, now kind of discuss how we might begin to interpret the site and this landscape. <clears throat> so how, was, uh, how did power emerge and how was it underpinned at sites like Rhiney in this early Pictish period? Well, first of all, I want to suggest that this was not simply a fortified site, but a landscape of power that both materialized and sustained a sacral form of kingship that emerged in pagan northern Pictland. Uh, the architecture of the fortified itself uh, um, would undoubtedly have been the product of asymmetrical power relations. So people coming together, in some cases coerced, coerced or with little choice, to create a form of ar architecture that expressed power and dominance. Uh, the architecture in respect was not a mute representation of hierarchical power relations, but power was materialized through the acts of construction and use of the architectural forms built at Rhiney. So as uh, Gleason notes, uh, Patrick over here, uh, for royal architecture in Ireland, although conceptually a uh, demiuric uh, regal achievement, the actual endeavor of monument construction represented a menial task, the preeminent pre symbol and obligation of clientship, that kings were forbidden from committing in, in law tracts. Those who undertook the work were subjects who partook in fashioning the very mechanisms that thereafter facilitated their own oppression. And I really like, like that quote. Um, so in other words, the creation of this architecture was entangled in the very social hierarchies that the architecture, once in use, continued to express and maintain. So with each mound of soil, each plank inserted into the foundation trenches, people were creating the architecture of dominance and recreating the contract between ruler and the rule that clientship and kingship entailed. Um, the finds from the finds from Rhiney also suggest that this was uh, a place of assembly. <clears throat> so, um, and one where clientship was enacted. So, as noted already, the finds suggest that high status objects were made on site, presumably for redistribution to followers of the king and lineage. Uh, the presence of amphora from the, from the Mediterranean, probably for storing wine and drinking glasses in which intoxicating liquids would have been consumed are material traces of the feasts and assemblies that may have taken place here. Again, these material el elements were not passive. It was through intoxication that followers became ensnared in the networks of power. We might be involved in that later on, I think. Uh, in operation, and the gifts of brooches and pins bound them into a web of reciprocity, so I can't say that, uh, that allowed particular lineages to engage and sustain rulership. <clears throat> so clientship would have entailed preparing the site, an occasion of assembly. The high status finds at Rhiney and the long distance connections they represent suggest that the assemblies here were a provincial or a wider status. <clears throat> As has been suggested uh, in relation to a number of other, uh, other early royal centres, the, lineage, the lineages that control this landscape may have referenced their dominance through their connections to the ancient past. So even today, a view from the cross stain encompasses a landscape replete with history. The area is a known concentration of ancient stone circles, standing stones, and rock art. And the cross stain itself may be a reused standing stone. And one of the other Rhiney stones bears cut marks. Bronze Age or Neolithic rock art can still be seen towards the base of the stone. So in this way, the relics of the past were recycled, reappropriated, and bound into the legitimacy of new lineages of rulership. <clears throat> the reuse of these places and the materials used may be part of the real and mythic histories of the present community who controlled this landscape. <clears throat> the more recent past may have, been important, may have had important roles to play too. So in the background, this uh, eminence in the background here, 
you can see the magnificent Tappanoth Hill Fort, Scotland's second highest fort. Uh, detailed surveys by the Royal Commission have shown that the lower slopes of the fort are surrounded by a huge stone rampart and a summit by an incredible vitrified fort. Hundreds of house platforms encircle the summit. The site has to be a strong contender for a major Iron Age tribal centre of the northeast of Scotland, and the fort may well have seen reoccupation in the Pictish period. Unfortunately, entirely undated, so yeah, that's uh, a future, future project. <clears throat> Back down in the lowlands, uh, our excavations over the last two years have shown that the landscape may have also been imbued with the spirits of the uh, recent dead. The first edition map records the discovery of human remains where a turnpike road was built through the village in the earlier 19th century. Up here. Uh, the cross stain complex is uh, roughly down in this location here. Um, a newspaper and published accounts record long kiss being discovered during the creation of the southern, southern part of the modern village. One of the Pictish warriors, uh, Pictish stones, a warrior figure here, um, was found near here and was recorded have been, as being found in a cairn in this location as well. <clears throat> in 2013, we found two square barrels, one with a partially preserved burial on the outskirts of the village. The burial was of a woman and the remains date to a period contemporary with the fortified enclosures near, near the cross stain. Our work this year found another possible ring ditch, possibly prehistoric in this case, and the remains of a cairn near to where, where the warrior figure was found. So here's our ring ditch here. And just in these gardens here, we found traces of a large <coughs> cairn and also a little building uh, in, in this area here as well. <coughs> so like fortified enclosures, whose, con whose construction appears to, be under, who appears to have underpinned major developments in 5th and 6th century society, Burial II underwent major changes in this period, with the 5th and 6th century a major innovation horizon in mortuary practice. For the first time in millennia, burial became a prominent practice once again. In Ireland, ancestral graves uh, were important landscape markers, and at places like Tara in incorporated into ceremonies of legitimization of kings and new dynasties. The graves at Rhiney focused on the north-south routeway through the valley, may have been part of the ceremony, ceremonial entry and threshold to this royal landscape. <clears throat> in Ireland and in Scandinavia, scholarship has increasingly identified cult and the cultic practice as an important element of kingship ritual and an element that underpinned elite power in the early first millennium AD. In South Scandinavia, places like Gudme and Apokra were not only secular centres of power, um, but places where cult was intertwined with rulership. Uh, these places were the stage set setting for performances that through bodily action and alignments of king's land and sanctity underscored the dominant, if at times precarious, hierarchies of power emerging in the post-Roman period. Likewise, in Ireland, the great royal landscapes such as Tara were, were where the other world could be accessed and the power of kingship supported by references to the eternal and the sacred. Ceremonies such as the bull feast at Tara confirmed the present order. The large quantities of animal, animal skulls with a focus on cattle, a site such as Lagor, may be the archaeological signatures of, of such rites. A common element of traditional rulership is that, it is, com is that it combines political and religious powers, with the king, a ruler and a priest acting as an intermediary between heaven and earth. So to re return to the Rhiney man, the Rhiney man carries an axe that is, finds its closest parallel in the axe hammer found in the Sutton Hoo ship burial. The axe at Sutton Hoo has recently been reinterpreted as an axe for sacrificing cattle and a symbol of sacral kingship in a pagan context. As Dobat notes, animal sacrifice was central to notions of leadership in a pre christian context where there was a very blurred line between secular power and leadership and cult. <clears throat> Other images of axe carriers underline the ritualized roles that axe of this type may have played in early Pickland. And depictions on Christian cross slabs suggest some of these practices may have continued and or were explicitly revoked once a Christian notion of kingship began to take hold. The gruesome form of Rhiney Man and the part person, part animal form of some of the other depictions of axe carriers suggest a shamanic element to this belief system. The axe undertaken may well have underlined a re reflexive relationship between king and gods where shape-shifting and transfiguration were a necessary part of accessing the gods. Animal sacrifice, giving in order to receive the blessing of the gods, may be an important element of the rites conducted at Rhiney. And the importance of the axe might explain some of the most startling, uh, one of the most startling finds of the excavations so far, 
which is this incredib incredible little um, axe-shaped axe pin or pendant made out of iron, uh, which uh, in this period you can't cast iron, you have to hammer it out. So it's, it's quite incredible. And you can see here on the axe pin um, a serpent biting onto the back of the axe, perhaps representing the spirit or, or life force of this, of this pin. <clears throat> Um, practice of this type obviously have a long history. So in Roman practice, bulls were sacrificed to gods such as Mars and the regional variants. Uh, and the sacrifice involved the victimaris, a sacrificial servant, stunning a bull with an axe or a mallet before cutting its throat uh, and uh, to examine it for uh, good omens. Mars was, of course, a god of war and the presence of a warrior cult at Rhyne could also explain the depiction of an armed warrior as part of the iconography at, at the site. Like, the, like Mars, this figure carries a spear and a shield. <clears throat> the wa warrior figure came from near the village, and near here there are other intriguing features of the archaeological record which su suggest other cult elements in the landscape at Rhiney. Here um, is an excavation in 2013 which revealed two square enclosures very close to where the burials were found. So the two square barrows were in this location here and the other burials are recorded in, in this area here. Unfortunately, our excavation didn't reveal much about these square enclosures, other than we couldn't date them. Um, but the closest parallels for this, these type of structures are um, enclosures interpreted by John Blair and others as Anglo-Saxon pagan shrines. Uh, the best known and most discussed is the one at Yevering, a timber enclosure associated with burial here. Um, but others are found uh, overlying uh, prehistoric mounds, um, and clearly they were important focuses at major Anglo-Saxon uh, landscapes. <clears throat> In England, the dating evidence, which is also very shaky, suggests that the larger and more monumental examples dated to the 6th and 7th century AD, during the last pagan generations. Use of such enclosures and the practices associated with them look back to similar practices in Iron Age and Roman Iron Age contexts. Uh, and this is one further way in which cults and relationships to the past were drawn upon by er early medieval elites. <clears throat> Finally, we should return to the sculpture of Rhiney once again to identify the ways in which power was materialized, materialized in this landscape. Again, the material environment of kingship was not a passive element of the networks of power. In the sculpture, with each hammer the chisel, the sculptor was locking him and the king's followers into particular frameworks of power. And here that message drew on the power of the written or symbolic message carved in stone that made oral history more permanent and harder to resist. The most convincing interpretation of the symbol stone repertoire is they re represented personal identities of some kind. So in the later stones you can see people marked by the sim symbols here. Um, almost certainly, again, elite identities. And look at the other symbols here, the tongs. Um, and the hammer uh, from smithing. <clears throat> um, so perhaps representing a form of personal names or identity of, of some, some type, and given their context, I think we can have little doubt that these were elite identity, identities represented in stone. So the creation of the picture symbols can be argued to have created a new form of memory, one where a distinction between myth and history first emerged. Writing, whether alphabetic or a more simpler form, is of course a source of power in all societies. The origins of scripts enables knowledge to be confined to a small percentage of people. The introduction and use of symbols may have operated along similar lines, creating different registers of, of, of literacy between social elites and the wider population. In this respect, symbol stones were documents with authority, as Driscoll said in the 1980s. The occurrence of the symbol stones at Rhiney Mediating access to royal fort underlines the role of the symbols in conveying royal or at least elite authority. At Rhiney, the materiality of the stones contrasted with the timber and earth of the enclosures and buildings of the settlement. These were monuments that were meant to endure and project important messages and iconography into the future. These monuments were also designed to be encountered by the body in particular architectural arrangements. They were not isolated monuments, but part of the built environment and important landscape markers. Following Gell, we can highlight the way in which artworks captivate or enchant the viewer through their artistry and emotive force. 
While symbols may have been designed to communicate information, this was not done in a passive, passive way. These were bold and confidently carved symbols that were designed to have an active role in the communicative processes they were engaged with. Briny Man was undoubtedly designed to inspire awe and perhaps fear into those who saw him with his exaggerated features that give the figure a sense of hyper-realism or otherworldliness. Indeed, Gell's observations that art in traditional societies is commonly produced in the context of legitimizing power through association with supernatural forces seems an apt context for the production of the Rhiney sculpture. <clears throat> the Pictish glass one stones found concentrated in northern Pickland can be compared with the Ogham, uh, Ogham stones of, of Ireland. Uh, most of the Ogham stones date to the 5th and 6th centuries likewise and appear to convey the identities of powerful lineages. The inscriptions denote identities of individuals who may have been kings in their immediate areas or provincial kings or, or dynasties. These stones, like the Pictish ones, appear to be located in strategic positions in royal landscapes of power, material manifest manifestations and mnemonics of powerful lineages who used the propaganda of the written word to bolster their social positions. <clears throat> How did this all end? Not well, presumably, for the cow. Um, <laughs> uh, radi radiocarbon dating suggests that this landscape of power ended or was radically altered at the very least in the 6th century. Was the lineage that Rani ultimately unsuccessful? Possibly, but the place name endured and the standing monuments remained in the landscape for more than a thousand years. Rather, I suspect that what happened was that the particular form of kingship at Rani soon became redundant. In Ireland, in Ireland the earliest text on royal governance, the uh, Testament of Moran, uh, decries the bull king, perhaps by, associate, by association the pagan king. In an increasingly Christianized world, the practices and identification of the king as the divine king were clearly increasingly untenable. With the increasing influence of Christianity, the royal landscape at Rhiney becomes less relevant to the prevailing discourses of power in the early medieval north. At the fortified enclosures um, at Rhiney, <clears throat> some elements of the enclosures appear to have been burnt, but other elements of the archaeology suggest a more ordered end to this landscape of power. At one of the outer box uh, rampart postals, for example, <clears throat> uh, the post appears to have been deliberately dismantled and the remaining void backfilled, absolutely packed full of animal bone and the metalworking tongs were found rammed into the upper fill of the postal. With acts like these, the ritualized elements to the life history of this early Pictish royal site were perpetuated, but also, also ultimately ended. Thank you very much. <clears throat>